How many people want to learn how to be better leaders in the 60 minutes? I'm privileged to be here with you. Not, not everyone. You've got to put, put your hands. Uh, how many people want to learn how to be better human beings in the 60 minutes we're together? Half the room? No. That's... How many of you actually want to have fun in the 60 minutes that we are going to go on this leadership journey? Yes. Uh, Right? I mean, we don't want this to be a boring leadership presentation. Have you seen those people? They have no sense of fun anymore in government or in the private sector. It's like an asleep person in the office next to you. Have you seen anyone like that? How many of you have someone like that sitting next to you right now? <laughs> so what I want you to do is take the person, the arms of the person next to you, and just shake them and say, wake up. We're going to learn how to lead at the next level of world class. So, I also want you, I usually speak in the morning, so in the afternoon is interesting, and I want to keep your energy high, because we live in a world where energy is more important than even your intellect. That's so we can talk about energy management, but it's a key point. Eat less food, get more done. You are paid to inspire. You're paid to have energy. Also, how many people in this room, and I think I'm in the right room, love to learn? Show of hands here. You might want to write this down. Education is inoculation against disruption. Education is inoculation against disruption. The person who knows the most wins. We're in a world right now, obviously, tremendous volatility. One of your game-changing advantages is outlearn everyone around you. And this is such an obvious advantage. It's what I call a gargantuan advantage because most people spend the best hours of their days watching Dancing Cats on YouTube. We live in a world where people don't study anymore, where people don't practice rigor around their craft, where people are not learning anymore. See, the victim loves entertainment. The leader loves education. The victim loves leisure. The leader loves learning. And it, we live in a world where people are addicted to their devices. You know, today, for 60 minutes, turn your devices off or don't look at your devices. Your devices, your addiction to checking every WhatsApp that comes in, every notification from Facebook, every social media post is costing you fortunes of productivity, creativity, impact, and influence. Anyone with me on this by a round of applause or a show of hands? You know? And I hadn't planned to teach this, but you want to start learning about oligodendrocytes. That's a good cocktail party word to use, or at, the, at dinner tonight, say, I was with Robin Sharma, and I learned about oligodendrocytes. But here's, anyone interested in the neurobiology of mastery? One, one person? Come on. I mean, we hear speakers talking about leadership. Don't you want to know what happens to your brain when you focus? So, when you focus monomaniacally on a project or a skill, a neural pathway gets set up around that one skill. Are you with me? Show of hands. Soccer player, football player, go to practice, deep practice every single day. You isolate a neural pathway. Every time you practice your skill, whether it's leading, whether it's innovating, whether it's managing change, whether it's communication, every time you turn off your phone, you get away from distraction because... Every genius has one thing in common, extended periods of time away from distraction and interruption. So when you get away from distraction and interruption and you focus on that one skill or that most important project, the neural pathway gets stronger and stronger. And the more you practice the skill, the more that neural pathway gets isolated. Now, when it gets isolated through deep practice every single day in an undistracted environment, oligodendrocytes, look at the person next to you and say oligodendrocytes. Just do that for me. 
a little participation here in Dubai, please. Um, okay, so oligodendrocytes get triggered and they release a fatty tissue called myelin. Myelin, say that for me please, myelin. Myelin is thought to be by many researchers and scientists on high performance to be the secret of genius. Wayne Gretzky says, I didn't skate to where the puck was, I... Come on, we're in Dubai, hockey is popular, no? No, he said, I didn't skate to where the puck was, I skated to where the puck was going. Steve Jobs, I could see around corners. Messi, bend the ball like Beckham. These people were not naturally talented. They stripped away distraction. They develop a monomaniacal focus on mastery. They did it over an extended period of time. They did it over an extended period of time. And what happened? Their brain kicked in to create a pharmacy of mastery that every single one of you in this room has. Is that exciting? Look at the person next to you and say, that's very exciting. Look at the person on the other side of you and say, the bald man in the black shirt is smarter than he looks. Just do that for me, please. <laughs> now, I just want you to know, Anders Ericsson is one of the preeminent researchers in the field of exceptional performance. And Anders Ericsson is actually the researcher from Florida State University who discovered or innovated the 10,000 hour rule. It was Anders Ericsson. Now, a lot of authors have popularized. If you want to, you know, if you want to be the Mozart of government, you want to lead like Picasso, people have now realized, thanks to Anders Ericsson, you need to focus on your craft for 10,000 hours. And so when you do, your brain starts to create this pharmacy of mastery. Anders Ericsson actually says it well. He goes, you know what, Picasso and Mozart and Metzi and Federer, those people are gifted, but you have the gift too. Because the gift of genius is a brain that can adapt through practice and focus. It's called what? Neuroplasticity. You all have that gift. And so the fact that you are here with me today at the World Government Summit is awesome because you're showing me how many people in this room want to be the heavyweight champion of what you do? Show of hands. Fantastic. How many of you would like to be so good at what you do that when you go to work on Sunday or Monday morning, you get a standing ovation like Lady Gaga coming down from the ceiling? <laughs> Great opportunity because people are not performing at mastery. You go into a taxi, you go into a shoe shop, you go into a restaurant. How many people practice deep craft rigor? How many people study? How many people are engaging in daily practice? How many people are fit like a pro athlete? I mean, I'm going to, if I have some time, I'm going to share, these are gargantuan advantages just because most people just show up at work. Most people just get through the day. Most people spend the best hours of their best days watching House of Cards. It's a good show, but... And so for the person who says, you know what? I want to stand for immortality through creating a legacy born of mastery. You have a stunning opportunity. So the first thing I want you to do is stand up, please. Everyone stand up. Because, and just so we stay loose and get to know each other, you know, I want you to find someone around you and look at them deeply in their eyes and say, you look even better in person than you do on your Facebook profile. Just <laughs> do that one for me, please. And give yourselves a nice big round of applause. One more, one more time like you really mean it. You know, I got to tell you, you are mostly government leaders. Your energy, will, your energy will be contagious. You can't inspire people to do world-class work if you are not inspired. If you have lost the sparkle in your eye that you had when you were four years old, look at the person next to you and check if there's a sparkle in their eye.
No, I, I am. <clears throat> look, I, I am here. I, I am here to share with you about leadership, and I know, I know your sophistic. I, I know. I know you're sophisticated. I know some of you are senior leaders. I know some of you have big responsibilities. Look, let's be really honest here. We're a bunch of human beings, okay? And if you want to galvanize and excite a team of people to do world-class work, you have got to be authentic, passionate, giving, caring, You've got to break down the silos. You've got to lead by example. You want your people to know more about what, you, what they do than anyone else in any other department, any other nation. Do you do it? You want people to say, you know what, we have an opportunity to shape the future and to take care of the citizens of Dubai or the citizens of one of the other emirates or wherever you're from around the world. Do you really connect with that mighty mission is that mission in your prayers or in your journal? Would you take a bullet for that mission? Oh, Robin, you're talking motivation. No, study emotional contagion. Your energy, your emotions radiate throughout your organization. So no matter what you say, people pick up and model what you feel. Look at the person next to you and say, I better write that down. So here's, here's what I want you to do as well. I want you to find someone around you, next to you, and just say, um, just so the energy is high in the afternoon, just find someone to say, I I'm looking good. Here's what I want you to say. I'm looking good. I'm feeling good. Do you think I should go to Hollywood? <laughs> go ahead, just do that. <laughs> All right, and more than anything else, more than anything else, I, <clears throat> I want you to... I want you to celebrate yourself for being here. So give yourself a big, passionate standing ovation for being here. All right. Have a seat. What a great audience you are. I've, I've spoken to a lot of government audiences. There's a, there's a lot of energy in this room. Give your, that's great. So, I wanted to start off with, you know, actually my father is going to be, how, how many of you have children, by the way, show of hands, wow, how many of you were once children yourselves, just put your hands up. <laughs> now I know here in Dubai there's such a great love of family, so my dad is going to be 80 years old this June. And uh, my dad is one of the icons in my life, you know. He retired after 54 years this past year, la last year, after 54 years as a general practitioner. And I said, Dad, why did you stay as a doctor for so many years? And he said, Dad, uh, Robin, no, he didn't say Dad because I'm his son. <laughs> that would be awkward. <laughs> but he said, because my patients need me. And, you know, mission... Mission, mission is so important. If you look at all the great leaders, they had a mission, a mighty cause that was bigger than your life. You want to overcome adversity? You want to deal with volatility? You want to stay nimble and agile as a government leader? You want to own the game? Start discovering what your mighty mission is. I, I hadn't planned to share this, but... I've fallen in love with this quote. Oh, and I don't have the quote with me, but anyway, it's a good quote. Um, but my dad shared another quote when I was growing up, and he, it comes from Rabindranath Tagore, and he translated it from Sanskrit into English, and he posted it on our refrigerator door so my brother and I could read it every morning before he went off to school. And I'd love to share it with you because it simply said, Spring has passed, summer has gone, and winter is here. And the song I meant to sing remains unsung, for I have spent my days stringing and unstringing my instrument. 
As I grew older, I asked my father, I said, Dad, what was that poem all about? And he said, Rob, and that poem was written by a man whose heart was filled with regret over a life half lived. That man was always getting ready to express his gifts and his talents. That man was always getting ready to sing the song of his life. He was always getting ready to make a difference, but he got busy being busy, so the great song that his life was meant to be died within him. I'm going to challenge you here. It has never been so easy to be busy being busy. It has never, it has never been so easy to spend the best hours of your days chasing distractions. You want to be a great leader? Here's one line to think about. You can be distracted or you can get epic work done. You can't do both. How many of you in this room are experiencing death by discussion? Leaders don't spend their days mostly in meetings. If you want to lead, you've got to execute. If you want to lead, you've got to get stuff done. Here's a brain tattoo. Less talk, more do. Less discussion, more execution. Less ego. Less ego. I'm, 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 here's my title. Less ego, more results. Less taking, more giving. Less busyness, more production. Less complacency, more creativity. Less what's in it for me, more what's in it for the people I am blessed and have the privilege to serve. Less entitlement, more earning. Less lazy, more productivity. The uh, man on the screen, or the example, is a story I want to share with you because it's about a man named Joey Dunlop. Joey Dunlop was a five-time world motorcycle racing champion. Joey Dunlop was a sports superstar. I learned about Joey Dunlop when I was in Northern Ireland a number of years ago. How many people have heard about Joey Dunlop? Show of hands. No one. Interesting. One. Are you from Northern Ireland? So you're near enough, yeah. So you know about Joey Dunlop. Of course. Yeah, so everyone was telling me, you know, you got to learn about Joey Dunlop. And Joey Dunlop was a five-time world motorcycle racing champion. He was adored by the people in his country. Sadly, Joey Dunlop was killed when the motorcycle he was driving hit a tree under wet conditions in Tallinn, Estonia. But you know what? When no one was looking, because leadership in many ways is about how you behave when no one is watching, he would take the trailers that would carry his motorcycles and he would fill them with food and he'd drive to Romania and with his bare hands he would feed hungry orphans. And when Joey Dunlop died, 50,000 people left their homes, left their work, and streamed out into the streets to give testimony to the way that this man lived his life. 50,000 people honored his character and the way that this man lived. And I propose to you that Right now, you are successful government leaders. Some of you are in the private sector, and a lot of you have big titles. How many of you in this room think you're successful? Show of hands here. Excellent, because you are. And yet, let me ask you this question. What if, what if the things that you now believe to be important on the last hour of your last day, you realize those things matter very little. You see, this society has sold us that on these measures of success, like how much money you have, the car that you drive, the title on your business card, whether you're eating in the right restaurants, whether you're accumulating, 
But I propose to you that those are false seductions. Those are shiny toys that real leaders do not pursue. You see, and if you want to have the results only 5% of the population has, you've got to be willing to think and behave like only 5% of the population. And that's why every true leader in government and in the private sector, they're called weird. They're called eccentric. How about a round of applause for the misfits, oddballs, and eccentrics? When you do the things of real leadership, you're going to be called strange. Get strong enough in your own skin that when people laugh at you or when they throw stones at you, you keep on going. And I propose to you only two things are going to matter when you get to the end of your life. Show of hands. Anyone interested? Number one, and look at the great wisdom literature. Look at the great biographies. Last summer, I stood in Nelson Mandela's prison cell on Robben Island, where he spent 18 years of his 27 years in confinement. Look at his life. Only two things are going to matter when you get to the end. Number one, it won't be the handbag, the watch, the title, the money, the cars. It won't be social status. It won't be jockeying to be liked, it'll be, who did you become? Did you have honor? Did you have dignity? Were you a woman or a man of authenticity and integrity? Were you a person of your word in a world of broken promises? Were you someone who created value even if you swept streets? Who did you become? Were you brave? Were you graceful? Not only when your career was going well, but when your heart was broken. Nelson Mandela, tortured, given dog food, kept in that prison cell for 18 years, I was in there, not even, a blank, not even a bed, just a blanket. And yet when he was released, yet when he was, yet when he was released from prison, he invited the jailers to his inauguration. And he was asked why, and he said, because if I didn't, I would still be in prison. You know... Let, let's, let's talk about what leadership is, okay? And it's, who did you become? How many people do you know that are real? Real. That's a gorgeous opportunity. In a world of such superficiality, you're authentic. Are you deep? Are you honorable? So who did you become? And number two, how many people did you help? How many people did you help? How many lives how many, how many lives did you touch? When I was growing up, my dad used to say to me, Robin, when you were born, you cried while the world rejoiced. He said, son, live your life in such a way that when you die, the world cries while you rejoice. And I think that's the great opportunity of leadership. Who did you become? How many people did you help? And don't forget to have fun along the way. I was in a grocery store a little while ago and I saw a mother pushing her baby and the baby was crying like you can't imagine. And I overheard the mother saying, don't scream, Jennifer, don't yell, Jennifer, be calm, Jennifer. So I couldn't help myself. I walked over to the woman and I said, Madam, I can't tell you how impressed I am by the way you're speaking to your baby. And she said, no, I'm Jennifer. So, I'm here really to talk about leading without a title. And <clears throat> I can't think of a better example of leading without a title than Oziola McCarty. She didn't have a title. She wasn't 
a head of a department. She wasn't a minister. She wasn't a prime minister or president. She was a woman who washed other people's dirty laundry. And she had a choice because you have a choice every day. You can be a victim or you can be a leader. But you can't do both. And you can tell a victim because they give away their power to get results done to external circumstances and other people. I'll repeat that again. You know that you're behaving like a leader if you give away your power to get things done to external conditions and other people. So she could have been a victim way more than all of us because she grew up in wretched poverty. She lived in absolute adversity, one difficulty after another difficulty over the course of her lifetime. And yet, by the time she passed away at the age of 91, she'd been honored by world leaders. She'd met with prime ministers and presidents. She'd even received an honorary doctorate from Harvard University. So who was this woman and why did she receive such a claim? Well, here's her story. Ever since she was a young woman, she would take the coins that she would make washing other people's dirty laundry. And she would go down to her local bank and she'd make these daily, seemingly insignificant contributions. Just like every single one of you in this room, every single day, have the opportunity to make these small, daily, seemingly insignificant contributions. And those contributions or those little acts of excellence are so seemingly insignificant, you don't even do them. But small daily improvements, when done consistently over time, lead to world-class results. How do you build an epic life? One day at a time, one act at a time. How, how was Apple or Instagram or SpaceX or Dubai that started off as a little pearl fishing village in the desert? one act at a time. And so she would take the money she would accumulate and she would go down to her local bank and make these daily, seemingly insignificant contributions. And the days slipped into weeks, the months slipped into years. Before she knew it, she was 87 years old. One day she walks into her bank and she looks at the teller on the other side of the counter and he looks at her and he smiles. He says, Oli, Oziola, how are you? And she said, fine. He said, Oziola, do you have any idea how much money you've accumulated as a result of these little seemingly insignificant contributions and deposits you've made every day? And she said, no, why don't you tell me? He said, Oziola, you've accumulated one quarter of a million dollars. She said, he said, tell me what you want me to do with it. Well, she was a simple woman. She did not know how much money that was. So the man behind the counter got an idea. He put the 10 coins on the counter, and he said, Oziola, this is your money. Tell me what you want me to do with it. She pointed to the first coins, and she said, I want you to give these to my nieces and my nephews because I love them so much. Then she pointed to the remaining coins and said, I would like you to give these to set up a scholarship for poor African-American students who still know how to dream, who dream of being leaders and astronauts, mothers and poets, firefighters and police officers in a world that has forgotten how to dream. And that act of humanity in a world that also needs serious amounts of humanity touched people around the world. Ted Turner was so impressed, he said, if an elderly washerwoman could give away all her money, I could certainly give away a billion dollars, which is exactly what happened. A reporter tracked down Oziola and said, this is incredible. You're giving away all of your money. What's your dream? And she said, well, you know, I'm an elderly woman, but I, so dear, but I so dearly wish that before I die, I could see the first student walk across the graduation stage. But I know because of my advanced age, that's not going to happen. 
And yet, ladies and gentlemen, one month before she died, the first student walked across the graduation stage. And after Oziola died, another reporter tracked down the student and said, did you hear the news? Your benefactor has gone. Oziola has died. Do you have any comment? And I've never forgotten what the student said. Heaven couldn't have gotten a better angel. She was an inspiration. She was a blessing. And she was a treasure to the entire earth. That's leadership. So you can, you, can lead, you can lead without a title. If you are deriving your power within your government from the title on your business card, you're in a very vulnerable position because people will not follow you. They will not give you their best. They will not give you their energy, their create, creativity if they're just following you because you are the boss. Lead without a title. And if you don't have a title, don't give away your power and say, I can't lead because I'm not the managing director or the boss of this department or a minister or a head of state. Lead where you're planted. Because leadership isn't really about a title. Leadership is really an approach. Leadership is a way of being. Some of you might be from Human Resources, one of my favorite overheads. He said, we're looking for an aggressive, persistent salesperson, like, for example, the one who sold you that suit. <laughs> so let me give you some, some rules, some rules for leadership. And before I get into those, I want to give you, would it be helpful if I gave you some, vic, some pivot points to go from any form of victimhood to leadership? Show of hands, would that be good? Excellent. So, I usually don't share this, I'm gonna do it for you. But number one, the victim is all about can't. The leader is all about can. Now that's not just some platitude. Study the work of Ellen Langer at Harvard University and she talks about the psychology of possibility. And if this was so obvious, how many of you in this room have through daily practice around getting things done, automatically def default to can. Am I making sense here? How many of you in this room, if this was so obvious, you actually live the mentality of can, the philosophy of possibility? Mo most people, most people, it's all about can't. Here's why we can't do this. Here's why we can't have the best team. Here's why this project won't work. Here's why I can't get really fit. Here's why I can't make time to read. Here's why I can't be the Picasso of my industry. So number one, you know you're playing victim when you are thinking, speaking, and behaving in the psychology of can't. Number two, the victim makes excuses, the leader delivers results. The victim makes excuses, the leader gets world-class work done. And by the way, beneath every single one of your excuses lives a fear. The reason we make excuses all day long and then actually start believing the excuses are true is because we're frightened. Most people are afraid of their greatness. Most people are afraid of success. Most people don't deserve, feel they deserve very much. Most people are afraid to shine brightly in the world. So we, const we construct this architect. Am I making sense, show of hands here? You know, Bruce Lee said it well. He called them a self-constructed self programming. And I just want to challenge you. You might be reciting these excuses every day, and you're saying them so many times, you actually think they're true. Leaders are brilliant at self-deception. How many of you are really good at lying to yourselves? Most of us do that as human beings. And so the victim is very much about excuses. The leader is all about results. I can tell how well you're leading by the trail of results and value you've left behind. 
Third pivot point. The leader, the victim, is distracted. The, the, lead, the victim is distracted. Even here, I see how many of you can sit still without get, getting up? So, you know, you can, I see this at some people. They can't sit still anymore. They can't focus anymore. The victim is addicted to distraction. How many people feel sort of addicted to your mobile? Put your hands up. The leader is monomaniacally focused on a few things. What an opportunity. Most people are addicted to distraction. They're addicted to video games. They're addicted to their phone. They're addicted to gossip. They're addicted to moving and being busy. But let us not confuse being busy with being productive. The leader has built their professional life and personal life around just a few things so they do not dilute the bandwidth of their focus, their energy, and their potential. Does that make sense? Show of hands. That, but that's a very disruptive act. I'm suggesting to you, you don't build a wide life and you don't build a wide career, but you go really, really deep. And most people don't do that. Most people are so distracted. They don't, they're not present anymore. They're not, they look you in the eye, they're not present. They go home, they're not present for their children. Are you present for your teammates? The greatest gift you can give to another human being is the gift of your presence. And even if you want to do world-class work, how can you do world-class work if you're distracted? Here's the science. It's called emotional residue. Look at the person next to you and say, no more emotional residue for me. Just do that, please. Okay, and it's the afternoon. I want to keep the energy high. Everyone stand up for a second here. And we know about power poses, Amy Cuddy's research. And I was in... How many people like Italy? Show of hands here. So I, I was in this... I was in the south of Italy a little while ago, a little town called Monopoly, and I learned a power pose that is great for energy. It'll kickstart the brain. It'll get the serotonin and, and the cortisol down. So here's the power pose, okay? It's, it's no, yes, no, yes. I want you to do it to get your energy high. No, yes, no. Yes. Come on, one more time like you really mean it. Yes. No, yes. no, yes. 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 Give yourself a round of applause. Um, the victim is frightened. You can have a seat. The victim is frightened of change. The leader is inspired by change. Write that one down, please. The victim is frightened of change. The leader is inspired by change. And then the final one I'd leave you with is the victim is a follower. We live in a world that's so interesting right now. A lot of people are behaving in ways they see people on the social media behaving even though that's not right for them. It's an incredible world right now. Most people on the planet today are followers. Here's a, here's a game-changing insight. Think for yourself. How many people do you know think for themselves? How many people do you know are originals. Most people have not even made the time to think alone. What food do I like? What are my top values? What is real leadership for me? What are my true measures of success? What are the books I like versus the person I follow on the social media? It is rare to see a woman or a man thoughtful, deep, thinking for themselves. That's why I called the, these gargantuan advantages because most people are card-carrying members of the cult of mediocrity. Most people don't think for themselves. They're brainwashed. They're hypnotized. They're plugged into the matrix. They're watching all the media and they're being hypnotized and programmed into a way of living that I believe is heartbreak at the end. Let me offer you some, some um, I will offer you 
some insights for you to practice. Number one, five things to devote yourself to. I encourage you to make a commitment here in this room to be so good at what you do that we cannot ignore you. That comes from Steve Martin, the comedian. Be so good at what you do that we can't take our eyes off of you. Be so good at what you do that your department, your ministry, your government, your nation will not function without you. This is a massive opportunity. How many people do you know that are so good at what they do, the, the organization or the team cannot function without them? But it's, so be so good at what you do that we cannot ignore you. Very few people these days see their job as a, as a study. Very few people read. Very few people are attentive to the details. So be so good at what you do that we can't take our eyes off you when we watch you work. Second devotion, and I've mentioned this, is release your addiction to distraction. According to the latest research, on an average day, we're spending 2.1 hours a day in distraction. We are being interrupted by technology every 11 minutes. And it takes 20 minutes to focus your mind back on the work that you were doing before you were distracted. Edison was one of the greatest geniuses of humanity. You know one of Edison's key protocols? His Menlo Park. Edison's Menlo Park. He had this place where he and his small band of workers would go to, and they would get away from the world, and there was no distractions, no interruptions. And by doing that, he allowed the natural power of his brain to focus on ideas that change the world. And the science behind it is actually called transient hypofrontality. Anyone want to hear a little bit about this science or no? Show of hands, yes or? Here's the thing. When you develop your Menlo Park, when you get away from distraction, when you start to focus on that one piece of work that you want to take to world class, your neocortex, which is the seat of reasoning, starts to shut down. You see, because you never do your best work from the intellect, you do it from a deeper place. Your neocortex starts to shut down and your brain waves shift from Al uh, beta to alpha. Every day when you're at work doing distractions, being interrupted, living the daily life, your brain is in beta. But if you look at geniuses, they're operating at alpha waves. Once your brain shifts from beta to alpha, a pharmacy of mastery is created. Cortisol, which is the fear hormone, starts to reduce. A lot of us are in fear every day. We don't even know it. That's why we don't take risks. That's why we don't push the envelope. That's why we don't innovate. That's why we're afraid to be ourselves. Cortisol. When you're away from distraction, cortisol comes down. Dopamine, the inspirational neurotransmitter, is released and serotonin is released. And a pharmacy of mastery is actually created in your brain when you go into that quiet space to do very focused, concentrated work. Mihai Csikszentmihalyi of University of Chicago calls this the flow state. Every single one of us can create flow in our work. And when you get into flow, that's when the athletes do otherworldly things. That's when the great painters create these masterpieces. That's when the great government leaders do world-class work. But here's something I'm going to challenge you with. We all, according to science, so if you don't want to believe it, that's fine, but according to science, we can do world-class work. According to science, we all have genius within us. But here's the thing I want to challenge you with. We all want genius. We all want to be world-class, we all want to be great leaders, and we all want to live meaningful lives. And yet we're not thinking the thoughts, constructing the rituals, creating the environments that would create a world-class life and genius-level work. Show of hands, did you get, did, that, did I express that clearly, show of hands? 
And so that makes absolutely no sense. How can you get the results of mastery if you're not willing to do what's required for mastery? No idea works unless you will do the work. What else? Avoid the arrogance of success. So, you know what? Nothing fails like success. Show of hands, how many of you in this room feel you are very successful? Show of hands. Okay. Just so I see, show of hands. Okay, a lot of you, so you're in a very dangerous place. You know what I've been studying a lot? The fall of empires. Anyone interested in this or is it just me? What happened to the Roman Empire? What happened to the great empires? I also study the great leaders who were titans of industry. What happened to them? Why did they fall? I've made a study over 20 years because the essence of legendary is longevity. You can be great for a year. To me, the real icons are world class for generations. Now, in Rome, they had a type of slave called origa. Just say that, origa. One more time with a bit of energy. Origa. And the origa's job was to stand behind the dux. Say dux. The military commander. And the slave would hold a laureus crown, a wreath of laurels, and whisper behind the great Roman general this. Memento homo, memento homo, memento homo, which as you know very well is Latin for you're only a human, you're only a human. What's my point? When you get successful as most of you are, there is a massive seduction not to listen to your people anymore and speak in monologues. And I've been at this a long time, I've seen it. Let me ask you, how many of you in this room love the sound of your voice so much you don't listen to the people who you are privileged to lead? You are privileged to lead them. You can tell a real leader by the trail of leaders they are building. But when you're successful, it's easy to talk versus listen. When you are successful, it's easy to, to lose the fire in your belly to study. Do you still get up at 5 in the morning like you did when you were 18 years old and had something to prove? Do you still go to seminars every quarter and sit in the front row and take 40 pages of notes? Do you still get up in the morning and let's say in this culture, do your prayers and then get on the treadmill and sweat because when you sweat, you release BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor that actually repairs brain cells damaged by stress and reduces cortisol, which is the fear hormone, and releases dopamine. So even if you have no energy, you will be inspired. It's when you are successful, you are on thin ice. When you're successful, it's easy to let a retirement mentality creep in. When you're successful, it's easy not to go the extra mile for the citizens that you serve. Is this a valuable point? I'm curious, show of hands, is it resonating? So, as you become more successful, the key is to become more humble. Because every master thinks like a beginner and every professional still behaves like an amateur. And if this was so easy, why do so many empires fall? If this was so easy, why are there so few icons and titans on the planet? So this is a huge opportunity for you. As you're more successful, become a better leader. Work even harder. Be even less entitled. Study even more. Innovate even more quickly. The next point I want you to devote your, I encourage you to devote yourself to is leave people better than you found them. See, the job of the leader is really relationships. Starbucks is one of our clients. In Starbucks, there was a, a manager that understood that leadership is all about 
human connections and relationships. We live in an interesting world right now. We have never been so connected by technology and we've never been less connected as human beings. This is another gargantuan opportunity for you to learn how to deeply connect with other human beings. We're all brothers and sisters on a small planet. And yet, if you look at people, people are rude more than ever. People have walls more than ever. Stress, behind stress is fear. So a lot of people are so afraid right now. They've lost connections with other people. Yesterday at my hotel, a gentleman from Egypt served me my dinner. He came in with the greatest smile you have ever seen. I kid you, I wish I had taken a picture. He, his smile was huge. How often do you smile? And if you do, remember to tell your face. You know, are you kind to people? Do you know how to connect? So the Starbucks manager, she had a favorite customer. And the customer in this coffee shop, her name was Irene. And Irene had been a school teacher, but now Irene was in her 80s. And Irene would come into this coffee shop every single morning, beautifully dressed, perfectly attired, holding the hand of this elderly gentleman, also in his 80s. And every single morning, this elderly couple, so graceful looking, so elegant, would do the same morning ritual. They would walk over to the counter and they would order one cup of coffee, two cups, one pastry, and two forks. And when they could, they'd find the same table and they'd have a conversation. Because leadership is a conversation. If you lose the conversation with your teammates, you will lose your teammates. If you lose the conversation with your family, you will lose your family. You lose the conversation with yourself because you're so in the world, you don't spend time in the wilderness to detect your values, to see where you're toxic in your heart, to understand your beliefs that are limiting your performance, you will lose yourself. And I'm going to ask you, how many of you in this room are so busy in the world, living your life like a five-alarm fire, so engulfed in complexity that you've lost yourself? And yet it's so powerful to be a leader, to be yourself. People fall in love with authenticity. People are craving what's real right now. Is it here in Dubai too? Are we not craving what's real, real conversations, real work, real people, real values? So one day this manager noticed that Irene and the man were no longer in the coffee shop. And because she truly cared, she got very concerned. About two weeks later, she was in the bank and she saw Irene, but Irene was no longer beautifully dressed. Irene was disheveled and she was a mess and she looked very confused. And so this manager walked over to Irene and said, Irene, is everything okay? And Irene said, no, everything's not okay. And the manager said, what happened? And Irene said, well, you know that man who's been coming to the coffee shop with me for so many years? You know the man who holds my hand, the one that cares so much? And the manager said, yes. And Irene said, well, I never told you this, but that man was my husband. And he took a massive stroke and he's dead. She said, I'm all alone. I don't know what to do. I don't know if I'll even make it. And the manager looked at Irene and said, well, Irene, why don't you come back to the coffee shop and have a cup of coffee? And Irene looked at the manager and said, but who would I drink it with now? And the manager said, I will drink it with you. And so the two human beings went back to the coffee shop, ordered a tall cup of coffee, two cups, one pastry, two forks, and had a conversation. And all I'm suggesting to you with great respect is simply this. People, Maya Angelou said it so well. She said, people may forget what you say People may forget what you do, 
No one will ever forget how you make them feel. And ladies and gentlemen, if that was so easy to make people feel big like Mandela used to do, then why is it only one in a million people who their ego is so quiet they can listen and hear what other people are saying? Your job as a leader is to inspire people to do work they have never done, to own talents they have never discovered, and to allow the bigness within them to see the light of day. And that's why the real job of leadership is inner work. Everyone talks about mindset these days. Show of hands, have you heard of mindset? Everyone's talking about mindset. I've been teaching mindset for 20 years. But how many of you, let's continue to be totally honest, you've been to conferences, you've read books, you've been to events, and nothing ever changed. Put your hands up. Be honest. Most of the room. Let's be honest. Anyone want to know why? Because mindset without heart set is a hollow victory. Yes, I've made up a word. But the key is everyone's talking about mindset and they're operating from their intellect. But you know what constructs monuments? You know what made the monuments of Dubai? You know what made the, the Sistine Chapel? Do you know what makes the great art and history? It's not mindset. It's not intellect. It's not thinking. It's feeling. Heart set. And it's not only mindset and heart set, it's health set. You can't, here, write this down. You want to be a great leader? Don't die. Mindset, heart set. Work on your heart. Clean out your anger. Clean out your resentment. Let go of the past. These are the things that are limiting your productivity. These are the things that are limiting your performance. If you're subconsciously angry, if you're stuck in the past, you're not going to do genius level work. And there's lots of science about how much energy living the past takes. Am I making sense with these new words? Right? It's new, so it might be a little disruptive, but that's what leadership is. It's going to the blue ocean, green fields. Work on your mindset, work on your heart set, work on your health set. Energy is so important. How many of you get up in the morning while everyone else is asleep and you have a morning routine that includes, let's say, meditation, let's say, prayer, definitely intense exercise. I've walked you through some of the neurobiology, BDNF, cortisol goes down, serotonin goes up, dopamine goes up, your metabolic rate goes up, you repair da damaged brain cells, you fight stress so much better. Read the book Spark by Benjamin Rady. You'll understand that. Mindset, heart set, health set. And then here's another word I made up. Soul set. What's soul set? I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about doing the deep interior work required to live for a cause that's bigger than yourself. If you want to be a great leader in government, do the work required through journaling and prayer and meditation and long walks in the desert so you realize the shortness of life. And I'm speaking ancient truth here. If you look at the great philosophers, they are writing about what I'm speaking about right now. You're all sophisticated. We all think we're so important. But you know what? At the end of the day, the street sweeper gets buried next to the government leader. And we all end up as dust. And so my invitation to you is to divorce yourself from the herd because most people are not very happy. Most people are not doing world-class work. Most people are not burning optimists. Most people are not fit. Most people are not on a mighty mission. Most people are victims. And work on soul set, that fourth interior empire, so that when you go to work every day, you're living for the bigger mission of serving the citizens of your nation. And you're, that sounds like a platitude, but you will own the game if you actually hardwire it in to a way of thinking and a way of being. 
And why would you do it? It's a great secret of happiness, which I know you talked about yesterday. It's a great secret of energy. To live your life with meaning fills your heart with great joy. I've been at this 20 years. I could retire. I still got on airplanes. I still did a Facebook Live yesterday for, for 45 minutes, bringing on my A game as much as I knew how to do it. Why? To make money? I didn't sell anything. I did it to serve. Because to lead is to serve. To lead is to serve. And the final thing I'll end with is simply <clears throat> remember that failure is greatness waiting to happen. The victim looks at failure and gets knocked down. The leader looks at failure and asks themselves, what's the opportunity here? You see, every single one of us at work, I'll put it to you this way, the more you dream at work, the more you raise your standards, the more you say, I want to play at world class, I'm going to tell you something, you're going to get bloodied. The more you innovate, the more you're going to stumble. Even in your personal life, the more you dream, the more you reach, the more you dare, the more you're going to get hurt. That's just the price of ambition. My challenge to you is rather than when you fail at work because you're innovating or trying something new or being more authentic, rather than giving up and contracting, ask yourself, how can I use this failure to grow? My challenge to you with great love and respect is turn your pain into power. Turn your suffering into strength. And turn your failures into fortune. If you look at the great women and men of this planet, their hearts were broken. Some of them were tortured. Some of them were devastated. Well, what happens to most people, the people we don't even know about? They shut down. And they're living 30 years in the past with a broken heart. Am I speaking truth here? Show of hands. Okay, something happened to them, a divorce, an illness, a tragedy. It happened years ago, and they've never worked through it, and now they're blaming the world. That's a victim. You know what leaders do? They ask themselves, how can I use this tragedy? How can I use this suffering? How can I use this failure as a treasure? Because let's be honest. We don't grow when things are easy. When things are falling apart, that's the chance to learn empathy. When someone has wronged us, you can blame the wrongdoer or you can learn forgiveness. When someone has lied to you, you can learn boundaries. How many of you in this room? In your most difficult times, you realized how strong you are. So remember that failure is greatness waiting to happen. And with that, I want to thank you very much, and I hope I've been of service to you. Thank you. Thank you.